The biggest problem with America right now is a lack of cohesive culture. We don't know who we are. We can't define what our common values are. And because of that, there's no common ground. How do we solve that? Where is it going? How do we rescue our culture? All that and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Create Your Own Life Show. I am your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO and founder of Command Your Brand. We help our clients to combat cancel culture by placing them on the right podcasts and new media. You can grab our number one PR book, recently ranked number one on Amazon over at bestpodcastbook.com. Reminder, if you're brand new to this channel, like this video, leave us a comment, and smash that subscribe button if you support liberty, freedom, and want to build a better future. And uh, our guest today, I had the pleasure of being on his show not too long ago, uh, which is called Citizen, and I'm grateful to have him on today. So Dan Holloway, welcome on, man. Thanks. Uh, good to be here. Very good to be here. Uh, it's always, you know, w there's this trope these days uh, that how long is it going to take for two men to start discussing the Roman Empire? But I guess that's kind of the norm for you, right? And it has been since you're, well, I, for what, 15 years or so now. I got to give credit where it's due, though, man, because like it, whenever we've reached out to shows, it's always said like, hey, he studied the Roman Empire and nobody gave a shit. Mm. Um, and you were the first one to be like, so let's talk about the Roman Empire. And then all of a sudden, like, um, I've got uh, Tim Cast coming up re uh, pretty soon. Then I'm going to mm. talk about the Roman Empire. Just at the James Altucher show, talk about the Roman Empire. So, uh, thanks for dragging it out of me, man. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I love uh, I love James. By the way, he's one of my favorite uh, favorite interviews ever because he's just such he's such an interesting dude. He's such a nerd too. Like he, depending on when and time you link up with him, he's going to be fixated on one thing or another. And he'll he he like he'll take a year and become an expert at something, and then just do it for a while, and then it's on to the next thing. It's very funny. Um, I, I yeah. interviewed him. This is back in like 2019. We did a live event um, at Stand Up New York, the comedy club in, mm -hmm. in New York. And I interviewed James in front of a studio audience. And I asked him one question. And then he proceeded to talk for 45 minutes, um, yeah, which, is, uh, which is much of how he operates. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. I like so Dan, that. people that may not be familiar with you and what you do, man, tell us a little about who you are and what you do, man. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just give the highlights. Um, I was an sure. infantry, infantryman in the 82nd Airborne um, during the surge in Iraq. Um, got out, worked private security and uh, uh, like risk management stuff for a while. Worked for the federal government and intelligence for a little while. And then uh, I was the VP of marketing at Black Rifle Coffee. And now I own a media company called Tetherball Academy. And the, the primary shows are Drinking Bros and Citizen Podcasts. The thing I wanted to dive into today, because, um, you know, I, I always like to ask guests, like, what matters the most to you before we start chatting so I can kind of, you know, f look at our conversation that way. And the, the point you made, which I think is really, really important, is, you know, the thing that's really missing is there's no sense of, like, shared culture and shared values. And I guess, how would you describe, I guess, what it feels like at where we're at as a country right now? Like, how would you describe our current situation or condition? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, we're biologically programmed to build walls around communities, right? That, that, and in both the literal and the metaphoric sense. And you know this having studied uh, Western civilization for so long, that's kind of how we came about. If you believe that whole story about Romulus or whatever, right? But, you know, building the city of Rome was, a, was about insulating that culture from, and, and not just insulating the culture, but expanding the culture, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. giving it time to evolve, give it safety to evolve, and also to expand. Um, that's kind of what we do, right? And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a much more reasonable way to, um, to align and, 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 and I guess, uh, conjoin ourselves than some of the other ways that we do it by like race, for example, that's stupid. That's like race and, and ethnicity are the dumbest reasons you could, uh, uh, you know, couple or pair with, with a particular group or in out for whichever way you're going. Right. Even if it's sure. to hate somebody, it's stupid. Um, but it is very reasonable to align yourself based on common culture, common values, right. Which may, those two phrases may actually be synonymous to some degree. Um, and you know, we, we have, I think if you ask myself or yourself when we were in high school what it meant to be an American, we would have a very specific answer. They, they may be different answers, right? Uh, but we would have a, a specific answer. We would have an answer to that question. I'm not sure 
that a high schooler in America today has that answer anymore. And that's a reflection of the fact that we've allowed our culture to decay. Right. Um, and I, I, it's, you, you can blame a lot of things for it. You can, uh, uh, I, I do wonder sometimes if it's intentional, you know, um, it's like, uh, uh, there's no need to imply malice where incompetence will suffice. I think we all know, uh, sure. Hanlon's razor there, but man, it does seem like there might be a little bit of intentionality behind it to erode the culture. So, you know, that, uh, aside from the, the dinner table, right. Or in the military, the team room or the locker room or the frat house or the neighborhood or whatever, right. We have these hierarchical structures that represent like more and more niche versions of what our culture is at the very lowest part. It's our family. And then we go up and maybe it's our football team and you go on another step up from that. And it's generally speaking football or sports or whatever. And then, you know, you keep going up and up. Um, <clears throat> those commonalities are kind of like social lubricant. It's what allows us to look past the differences. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. and, it, and it's, it's like a really important thing. It's almost, it's better than alcohol, frankly. Like you drink alcohol to get comfortable in the social situation. But if you see a stranger and on the subway or something like that, and you're like, uh, you see him, he's wearing like a friggin' Atlanta, I'm a Braves fan. He's wearing an Atlanta Braves hat. You're like, oh, what's up? Braves fan? Yeah. And all of a sudden you're talking to each other, right? And here's the yeah. issue that we're facing today. We start off very close together, whispering, right? You get a little farther apart and you start talking a little farther apart and you start yelling and eventually you become so far apart that the only way to reach out and touch each other is with rockets and bombs. Right. And that's how uh, human civilization has always worked. So whether it's intentional or not, we still have this issue that we're in a period now where we're shouting across the room at each other. We're shouting from room to room at each other in a lot of ways. And we, we aren't connecting in the way that we used to. And it, it's, you know, what you see the fallout from that. It's interesting too, because there's the, the the quote from Andrew Breitbart where he talks about you know politics is downstream from culture, and and I think the issue is like we we've just you know whether it's the left or the right or whoever you want to say like we've we've lost culture like you're saying like we've lost that thing that brings us together, so we've kind of went into this purely political sphere where we're taking swings at each other, and and I think there's been people out there that have made claims of you know like civil war and things like that. And I, I, I think that's a little extreme. I don't think like we're, we're anywhere near that yet, but I guess at the same time, like how do we come back together culturally then, man? Like how do we get back to a shared set of values? Because it's interesting when you said like, Hey, thinking in school, like what, what is that thing? Like to me, the, the song, the Lee Greenwood song, proud to be an American mm. was the thing that came to mind. Like that is what I thought of, you know, being an American. Like I'm proud of my country. Uh, you know, I'm proud of the people that serve for it. And I just, I feel like we're in a weird situation now where, you know, it's embarrassing to tell people you're an American at the moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to choose to do that stuff. Um, you know, uh, Tim Kennedy, my friend, Tim Kennedy likes to make this, or, or he, he likes to say that every day in life is a thousand little choices. Right. Um, and you know, you can memify that too. I'm sure a lot of people have seen the meme that says, did you have uh, a bad day or did you have a bad five minutes and you let that become a bad day? Right. Um, and it, you know, the way you frame things, like I, I'm not, I don't want to get to, uh, people who are always talking about the universe and shit like that are annoying as hell, to be honest, but there is something and, and the power of positive thinking is a real thing. Right. And it isn't there. I, I don't necessarily think, uh, there's something metaphysical happening. I think it just changes your brain chemistry, right? You start looking for good instead of looking for bad. Um, and you know, if you want to sit around and you can do this with any culture and talk yeah. about how, um, despite the, the pretty incredible things that our founding fathers did, um, that they made some mistakes as well. It's like, all right, cool, man. Well, you, you can, yeah, if you, if you choose to focus on that, then you're going to return our culture to a place that's divisive. That's how that works. Right. But if you say instead, like, Hey, these guys were deeply flawed, just like everybody, just like me, right. I'm deeply flawed. So are you, so is everybody else. Um, right. but they seem like they were on the right track and notice how they use the phrase, a more perfect union, not a perfect one, but a more perfect one, which implies that there's always going to be some kind of constant struggle to make it better. And then 
accept that as your responsibility as a human being and as a citizen of this country. Like it's, it's all of our responsibility to make it better, not to get revenge, not to tear it down, but to make it fucking better. So, you know, that's, I just feel like we don't do a very good job of communicating that to people. So how, I guess, how do we do a better job at that then? Like, how do we, how do we come back together? Because I think the, the thing that's interesting is you look at it and I think the left controls a lot of like the wheels of culture, right? Like if you mm. look at it, like, you know, Hollywood, um, they, they control a lot of, you know, like government agencies and things like that. And the, the strange thing about the right is they think they, they, they don't really seem to care but when they get into those government positions, they're just as corrupt as the left. And I guess like, so how do we, how do we solve that then, man? Like, how do we fix culture? Cause obviously that's not the solution. No, of course not. Well, I mean, look, it matters, I guess from, uh, from that perspective, it matters who our heroes are. Right. The, the, and to me, this is kind of a, a twofold situation. One, it matters who our heroes are. And two, it matters what kind of time we spend with our kids. Right. Yes. Um, so when I say it matters who our heroes are, Heroes in culture are essentially, if you boil it down, it's aspirational marketing, right? Like, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that quarterback. I want to be like that, whatever, right? Um, and over the past, let's say, 30, 40 years, we've gone from, I want to be like Pat Tillman, who left a lucrative NFL career to go serve his country, or I want to be like Jimmy Stewart, who did the same, right? And he, I mean, he, he made it back, but... Um, you know, I want to be like these guys who kind of represent men who take charge of things and take responsibility for things to dummies on the internet, right? Who act like children and women, basically, right? Um, uh, then that's what you're going to get. Like if you if that if that's the product you're putting out there, that's what you're going to get. So, you know, from the conservative side of things, I can't call CBS and NBC and say, "Hey, you need to knock this shit off and stop putting it on there." I can't, you know judge i can't i can't take down things from social media nor would i want to because censorship is poison but i get to control what goes into my brain and i get to control what goes into my children's brains right um so you know i get it life is tough it's hard there's a lot going on it's busy sometimes it's frustrating um but as soon as you capitulate and sit your kids down in front of social media so you can get a break then you failed frankly yes and, and you know that it's uh, that's a harsh thing to say because, you know, I, I you, you have to understand people are going through a lot of stuff these days, but it's, it's not going to get any easier. Right. So if you well, think it's, that, it's interesting, if cause if you look at like, um, I don't know if you remember this, the, it was a couple of years ago in the Olympics, the Simone Biles thing. Mm, and yeah. and I, I got myself absolutely ripped to shreds on this one. But if you look at it, I think that was actually a breaking point describing where we're at because people are like, oh, she's so brave because she decided not to compete. And I'm like, you know, where is where is it when they're like, oh, you know, the guy was like, you know, Ronnie Lott cut his finger off and he went back into the game like we, we've lost that. And that's what a hero is. Somebody that that in spite of things is brave. Do, do you right. know what I mean? Like that's like that's a role model. Uh, yeah. I mean, as uh, Chris Williamson likes to say, do the thing. Right. That's what like. So now we we, we have entered into this era where. You can say you tried to do the thing and didn't like because you took a mental health day and decided not to even try, but you still get credit for having tried. It's like, no, that's not trying. Um, trying and, and not and, and it involves some action and not just like texting your boss in the morning like, oh, I don't feel good. I'm not coming into work. That's not trying. Right. Um, so, you know, we've lost uh, this. We, we've lost the intrinsic link between effort and outcome, we think. And, and you see it. It's, it's, I, I call it the thoughts and prayers problem, right? Like you, you've said the thing. You've, you've animated to whatever, the universe or, or whatever. Or more likely, you've animated to your friends and followers, right? That you want to do something about it. And then you choose to do nothing. That's what that is, right? Uh, and you get the same level of cred, street cred, as if you had done something, but you haven't done a goddamn thing. So mm -hmm. th this is like we're in the, we're in this feedback loop where everybody's talking about fixing problems and nobody's actually doing anything to fix them, right? So, you know, <clears throat> coming back to what you were saying before, uh, my show, Citizen, there's a list of principles. One of them is I'll do something every day to help my country. My countrymen are all men. Uh, and the, the purpose of that is 
to realign your brain. We, we've been turning into narcissists for the last, you know, however long, right? 40 years, let's call it. And staring into the mirror and we're going to turn into some flowers pretty soon. Maybe we already have. Um, but life's not about you, right? That we're biologically programmed to serve each other. And that's when we feel best. That feeling you get when you help somebody, that's what you're supposed to feel like, right? That's and instead of the instead of feeling that way because you took pills or took drugs or whatever, you, that that's where you're supposed to get that feeling is by helping other people. That's your it, it'll always be that way, whether it's your children, your family, or just random strangers, right? That that serotonin and dopamine hit that you get should come from these. It's like a biological tool, right? To to make you go out and help other people because that's how we all stay resilient against existential threats. Instead, you know, we medicate through whatever way, through, whether it's through social media or, uh, or through some kind of substance. And <clears throat> the only way you can really fight your way out of that is to become intentional once again. Right. So I, I can't like, and, and, you know, there are issues with this stuff. It's like the problem seems so large that you can't really solve them now. Right. Like, how am I going to solve uh, homelessness or hunger. I can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's become common to just either give up entirely and become cynical or to lean on platitudes that, that offer nothing to people. Right. But still make you feel good, which I think is a, a bad, bad thing to be a bad situation to be in. But the smart way to do that is to reduce the problem down to a manageable size. Right. And this is, this is like ants understand this. They, they understand that if I just do my part and encourage other people to do their part and hold everybody accountable, then the work gets done. Like I don't have to be a hero. I don't have to be Superman. I don't have to solve all these problems myself. All I have to do is do my part, right? And maybe I see the result of that. Maybe I don't immediately, right? But that's really, I mean, you know, not only is it all you can do, but that's what you should be doing. You, you shouldn't. And look, sometimes people are going to get called to, um, to solve bigger problems than others, right? Some people are, are positioned or more talented or more wealthy to do whatever. But for the most part, you know, you're a cog in a machine and that, that isn't meant to diminish you or who you are. That's just the reality of the situation, right? Yes. There's, there's billions of us. So I guess then, uh, one of the things that you had mentioned is really important is the idea of personal responsibility. And I guess we look at that, how do, how do we get back to that then? Because I think that is a big part of, you know, what's wrong here, right? Like people think someone else is coming to save you or, mm. you know, they say, that's not my problem. I, ha I have to worry about this. Like, I know like one of the big things that people have said, you know, post pandemic is, um, well, you know, I have this job or I have kids or I have whatever it is. And the, the problem is, Dan, if everybody says that, then nothing gets fixed and we just spiral. So like, how do we get back to personal responsibility? Sure. Yeah. I mean, look again, reassociating. I mean, it's, uh, there, there's a lot of layers to this because we're adults. Yes. We, we have to make these changes for ourselves. Um, but if you think about it from a security standpoint, um, defense in depth, like I have to create layers of security for myself and I have to create them in a way that persists over time. Right. And it's the same thing for sociology. We have to create a culture that is resilient and malleable to some degree, but, but resistant over time, right. To uh, existential forces. So <clears throat> I would say for yourself, you get to choose. Nobody can make you do the wrong thing. You have to choose to do the wrong thing. So every time you do the wrong thing, that is a choice you made. There's don't don't even consider blaming it on anybody else, you know. And people see that people will hear that and they'll get depressed, think like, "Oh, I'm a loser. I've I fucked up or whatever." It's like, no, man, that's a gift. That is a gift. Most of the time in life, you you don't you're not in control of everything, right? Mo the vast majority of the time in life, you don't have control over what's happening around you. Um, but in this case, in in the small to large decisions you make, you have complete control over that. And that is a gift. So I would say first recognize that Let, let's call it the Liberty muscle, right? Exercise yeah. that Liberty muscle. When somebody offers you some convenience, you know, at the cost of some of your Liberty, tell them to go fuck themselves, no matter how much it costs you. <laughs> um, and you know, then, you know, that, that's, that's for the adult. Uh, but we've got a big problem with our kids, you know, um, I would agree. It's 
and, it, and it, it's getting very dire. I mean, in, in ways I'm not talking about the curmudgeon, uh, uh, these kids these days or any of that nonsense. And by the way, people need to stop talking shit about the younger generations because, uh, you created them. You're the author of those younger generations. That's your fault. Don't blame yeah. the kids. They're fucking kids. You know what I mean? Like how, what the hell? Somebody, if like, if you met a shitty kid out in person, rude and annoying kid, uh, out in public somewhere, you would immediately judge their parents, right? Like those mm-hmm. parents are clearly not raising that child right. And you you would be correct to do so. But then we look at, you know, young adults who are out there in the workplace for the first time. They have no sense of, um, or they have a very strong sense of entitlement. They don't have a lot of work ethic. Have you seen the thing um, that there was uh, a high percentage, and, and and I'd have to look it up because I don't remember the top of hand of of uh, the the young generation bringing their parents to their first job interview? It's it's getting kind of out of control, man. Uh, no, I did not hear that. That's weird. Um, uh, no, I haven't heard that. But again, we're we're the author of this stuff, man. Yes, it's like you know. So again, once again, it sounds like a bad situation, but it's not because you have control over it. Right. There's no, there's no such thing. Like if I've been in a lot of gunfights in my day, right. Anytime that I have control over that situation and I can apply my strategy, my, my plan, my violence of action to that, that I feel like pretty good about that situation. That's the best possible scenario for me. And that's an extreme situation, but it's true anywhere in life, to be honest, anytime you have control over things like that, like even if it's just your own decisions, that is quite a bit of authority you have. Right. And exercising it appropriately is really important. So to the larger point, we have we have kids who need mentorship. They don't need coddling. They don't need to be coddled. They, like what? Like, I, I don't understand how we even got here. Like what? When, well, when, like for, for me growing up, Dan, like I remember. So I was I was a shortstop growing up and mm-hmm. I, was, I was a, a pretty good shortstop. Um, but I got to uh, my, my freshman year of high school and the coach's son was also a shortstop. He was terrible, but he was the coach's son. So he started at shortstop. And my dad's response was great. Well, what position are you going to learn how to play better? Right. So my, mm-hmm. my dad for every every week, every weeknight for a month three hours every night, hit fly balls to me. And I became, you know, the best center fielder in the league. Right. So it's like, what are you going to do with your situation? I think often people look at it and they're like, okay, well it's whatever. Good job, kid. Yeah. I mean, that's loser bullshit though. Right. Yeah. Like if you, if you want, if you want a society filled with people standing around with their hands in their pockets, waiting for somebody else to do something, then that's what you're going to get. If you behave that way. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I, I don't, um, It's weird. The safetyism stuff is very bizarre to me. Um, it wasn't even a consideration when we were kids. It's like walking. We're walking to school. Um, we're we're jumping off of stuff. We're not wearing helmets. You know, whatever. And and the fact is, there's no, like it's no more dangerous to be a child today than it was in the 1980s or 90s. Like there's not more inherent danger than there was before. The 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 inherent risk is not larger, but our predilection to bubble wrap children is way higher. And it's like, usually there is a cause and effect, right? So the cause wasn't the inherent risk that that would make sense. Right. So if like, um, let's say you're planning a national security strategy and there's an inherent risk of, uh, people pouring over your border, for example, typically you would do something to stop that, right? Because that would be the smart thing to do. But it would be a cause not, and effect. Not in this situation. country, man. No, we just, not we here, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there would be a cause and effect, right? There would be a, a physical cause and then a, a response to that to stop it or mitigate it or change it or redirect it, whatever, right? But in this case, there wasn't <laughs> – it wasn't like physical data. It wasn't like that more kids were getting hurt than ever. It wasn't that more kids were like this or that was happening or that more kids were, um, were committing suicide, right. Or anything like that. There weren't more mental health problems. And then we started doing this stuff. We started doing this stuff and then we developed more mental health problems. And the same thing happened. I'm sure you've heard of this study with, um, peanut allergies where in the early nineties schools across country started banning peanuts. Right. And yeah, the rate of kids who have peanut allergies um, in two in two different sectors. So the rate of just generalized peanut allergies went way up, right, by like 70%. And then the, the anaphylactic shock went way up as well. So it got – not only did it get worse uh, 
globally, but it also got worse for people who had serious reactions to it. The, the reactions became more serious and more frequent. So this tells you something. This is <laughs> this is <laughs> everything works this way. Natural immunity works. Like your body is way smarter than you are. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You're not going to outsmart nature. Now there are you know there there are times when it's become necessary to some degree. Like antibiotics, they serve a useful purpose to some degree, but wiping out your your entire gut health every time you get a little sniffle that's not a good idea bud i mean that that obviously is not a good idea because 95 percent of your serotonin is made in your gut like we've we've done all these antiseptic things all these safetyist things over the years and the re the repercussion of that has been come clear we are weaker as a species now right i mean and, and there's only one way to get back to that and it's to re-expose yourself to danger and i'm sure pe- i'm not sure people have the the I don't know what you would call it. The the required attitude maybe to do that. We're sort missing of stuff. grit. Like we're not we're missing mm. grit or that that hardiness, right? Like if you if you look at it, um I, I had a, a conversation with with uh, Dan Carlin from Hardcore History a couple of years ago about this. And he said, you know, if you look at it, we're so far away from some sort of real major conflict that like we've become weak, we've become soft. And I think it's almost like we need some hard times to kind of grow some balls back in some way. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, so the weight doesn't get lighter, you get stronger. That's the secret of life, right? And it's in, in every facet of life. You you don't you don't get better at taking tests without taking tests. You don't get better at learning stuff without learning skills to learn and actually doing the thing. You have to do the thing. That's uh that's it. You we're we're cosplaying life right now. We're we're pretending to be we're an avatar on the internet now instead of an actual human being. Who's, and look, you don't have to go work on a fucking farm, man. It's not like we, we were just fine in the from from the 1920s through the 1980s. We were fine. Everything went was fine. We were mentally healthy for the most part. Um, physically, not so much to, <laughs> after the 1950s because the, the federal government taught us that high grain and low fat diets were smart. But whatever, that was you know, you're a propaganda expert. You know how that goes. But <laughs> man, for the most part, mentally healthy, and we were in a, we were in modernity. Uh, and I, I don't think it's fair to just blame social media, but it did have, you know, I think social media did to the mind what corn syrup did to the body, corn syrup and MSG, like corn syrup and MSG are designed to replace salt and sugar, but they do so in a way that keeps you addicted to it. Right. Not just yes. like, not something you need, but something you have to have. And that, I think those are two very different things. And then on the technological side, on the, on the mental health and mental side, Social media turned this tool, this device that we used uh, for a lot of great things into something that was engineered to keep you addicted to it, to keep you on the screen as much as possible. And addiction is never a good thing. Like there's, there's never a positive outcome for that. If you appreciate the work that we do here and you want to support this show, the biggest way you can do that is by supporting the products that we know, use, and love and that I recommend for you here on the show. The first that I want to talk about is my pillow literally one of my favorite products the my pillow classic is what i use every single night it's handled a lot of my neck pain a lot of my back pain as you guys know i've been a competitive power lifter since my early 20s i've retired from that but i still take pretty good care of myself and i'm still pulling some heavy weights as i pulled 500 last week on deadlift and uh, our favorite product from we travel is actually the my pillow travel pillow and it's one of the things that we actually give to absolutely everybody it is a great product to fall asleep on. So if you want to go to MyPillow.com slash C-Y-O-L, they have some really great holiday deals over there. You can get up to 66% off of select products. Also, one of the biggest changes in my life over the years has been handling a lot of the parasites in my body. A number of years ago, I did a cleanse with uh, Dr. Jason Dean, and we removed these things called liver fluke from my body. They were actually eating my liver. It was kind of crazy. And every few months, I do either a parasite cleanse or his full moon detox that he's doing right now. So if you want to head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L and uh, grab some of his amazing products over there. I know he has a great holiday special going on right now as well. Support our sponsors. They help this show to continue and they help us to do what we're doing. And we could not do it without you. And you could do it just by uh, using the power of the purse and uh, supporting the products that we love. Thanks. Well, that's a really interesting point too about like, the the social media side of things. I feel like we, we've kind of fallen into this like post truth world now, and it's hard to be able to make a decision based on bad information. And I and I guess looking at it like 
it just seems like the the media side of things has gotten worse. Like, like how do you look at that and decide what's right and what's wrong, Dan? Like, I feel like that's the hard part about it. Um, you know, we well, we we touched on it before. It's uh, it is our shared epistemology. It's what makes a culture, right? So you can hear like if you if you heard a debate between two people fifteen years ago you would immediately know which culture they came from probably, right? Um, just based on the facts that they presented. And that's normal. Um, but now I'm not sure you could tell really, right? I mean, you right. might be able to tell what their political leanings are, but that's not a culture, right? That's 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 a lens through which you view your culture. That's, a, that's an entirely different thing. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how you return an epistemology you know what I mean? Like, I really don't know how that happens because um, there, there's so many, oh man, there's just so much incentive for people to not admit when they're wrong these days, which has usually not been the case in life. It's, it's, we've, we've been meritocratic for the vast majority of human history, not, not the patricians. They've always lied and propagandized and stuff like that. But the average person, right? The 99% of people, 99.9% .9 of people, it, it benefited them to live in a merit meritocratic way. That's why the Socratic method persisted for so long, right? I mean, in the early, even as fucked up as American education be became in the early 20th century, the Socratic method was still a very big part of it up until the 1980s, right? Just the idea of <sighs> postulating, testing, and then repostulating and testing just that process and jettisoning what's wrong, keep what's right. I mean, this, this ideology is old as fuck, man. I mean, Paul mentioned this in the Bible in the first yes. century AD to hold fast to what's true and, you know, study all things to hold fast to what's true. This is, this is from the Greeks. I mean, it's like 3000 year old ideology. It's nothing new, but we just well, keep it's on become now it. like more like, it's weird. It's almost like religion. It's like, this is the doctrine and whether it's right or wrong, you have to accept this doctrine, right? Or you're kind of not a part of the group anymore. It's become very strange like that. Yeah. It's weird how, uh, and I don't want to cast aspersions on religion as a whole. I think faith plays an important part in society. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, you know, if you look at it, America is a Christian nation. And I think that's sure. what made us good from the beginning. Uh, well, I mean, you can debate that. I think it's the fact that Christianity had, had made its way into modernity, right? That's sure. the difference between. So well, yeah, in the you, Middle Ages, the the Pope did some really terrible stuff, but you know, yeah. it's, <laughs> yeah. we, we can't forget about that. Yeah, and then you know, Americans in the New World, and people, people, I, I know it's a very cute story that we are that our first uh, ancestors here in the U.S. escaped tyranny and stuff, but the reality is that they were kicked out because they were crazy Puritans, right? Um, yeah. it, it's so they were they were kind of uh, fucked in the head as well to some degree, but you know. I think that that stuff plays an important role and um, so I don't want to cast aspersion on it, but it is sure. fundamentalism is a problem, right? And it's one thing if it's a problem socially, if you have, if you're a social fundamentalist to some degree, then <sighs> provided you're in a, in a, in a very well-structured country as we are, for the most part, that is just going to be, uh, present itself in the right of association, right? You're going to choose to hang out with people who think like you, which, you know, for your own sake is not the best idea necessarily. Although we do couple based on ideas and there's nothing wrong with that, but to only hang out with people who think exactly like you, that becomes a problem because you don't see your weak spots anymore, right? You don't challenge yourself anymore. And I think that's an issue, but it doesn't become authoritarianism necessarily, right? If it's, if it's on the social side. Now, when it, when it enters the economic and political side, then it becomes authoritarian. And now we've lost the faith part altogether. And we just have the religious fundamentalist authoritarian side on the economic and political side, right? So people are starting yes. to align themselves in these parties that don't really exist, right? I mean, it's like, no, no, none of the leaders believe any of this shit, lead, quote unquote leaders, they don't believe anything that they're saying. They all they're it, trying it, to do it, is stay useful in power. to them. Yeah. I think it's useful to them. So yeah, I mean, you've got to like, I don't like the phrase black pill because it, it it sounds cynical and it sounds like um, it sounds like you're dropping out of the process altogether. I don't think that's the right way to frame it. Um, I don't know what pill it would be that you took to say it's perfectly reasonable not to take a fight or not to take a side in a fight between two assholes. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't give a fuck who wins between these two dummies. I just we, we have we have a guidebook. We have the Constitution. 
and it says some things that I agree with. Um, and if you don't support that, then I don't support you. Right. So how do you get, I guess the question is how do you get people back to thinking that way and not just playing for team R or team D, you know, I think that's a hundred percent true. Like you hit the nail on the head. Like if you look at it, um, I'll bring another Rome reference in, but if you look at, you know, Rome's third century, the things they were dealing with were hyperinflation, immigration, and crumbling central power. Mm. They figured out how to fix it and lasted another 200 years and only fell because of barbarian invasions. And I guess if you look at it, like, I don't know that there's anybody here that can actually fix it. I think that's the problem. Like, we don't, we don't really have our best and our brightest running, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely for sure. We have octogenarians running for office. Um, you know, it would be a good idea is to have, someone who's actually going to have to live with the decisions they've made. That would be dope. That's right? a great point. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what do you think from, because a lot of people will invoke the Roman empire, Ro Roman Republic and Roman empire. Um, uh, uh, you know, when they're talking about, I guess the, the kind of cultural decay that's happening in the United States. And there's some, there's certainly some parallels, right? It's Western civilization. Sure, yeah, but we, it's, it's definitely not a direct parallel. I wouldn't right. say. Yeah. And we, you know, we haven't reached, <laughs> we haven't reached anywhere close to Nero or Caligula level for, for Christ's sake. I mean, we're not even close to that stuff. So uh, what do you think about that? Like if you, if you had to pinpoint us, let's say there was overlap. If you had to pinpoint us in uh, the Roman timeline, where, where do you think we are right now? Um, 283 to 301 is my, is my exact time period. So that's actually when Diocletian comes in and Diocletian, um, like he did a lot of good stuff, but he was absolutely terrible to Christians, um, because he said, okay, the, the thing we're missing is uniting culture. So we're all going to unite against the Christians. That's mm. what, that's one of the things that he did is as uniting culture, not, not the best plan, but he took a look at the major problems and he said, the problem is hard currency. Like what, what Roman emperors had realized that for, for years is they could get into power by giving the military more money. Because then the guy with the best army could always put himself in charge. So sure. it was at 15,000% inflation by that time period. So he comes in and he helps to put in hard currency. The next thing he does is he takes a look at, like, because citizenship had lost its value since 212 with Caligula, and, uh, or Caracalla, sorry. And uh, so he looks at, like, you know, what do we do with a tax base here? We need to make this a little bit more equal and figure out like, okay, if you're all going to be citizens, how do you pay for it, right? You can't all get mm. shit without paying for something. And then the other thing he took a look at is, is Rome was just way too big, right? So he, he introduced this thing called the Tetrarchy, which meant two, two big emperors and two junior emperors. So four guys in charge. Now here's the interesting thing, man. Like you can thank Richard Nixon for getting us off the gold current, the, the, the gold standard. So it's like, if we can get hard currency back, like that can fix things. It's going to be a little painful for a while, but it could start to fix things. The other thing is like, we don't need a tetrarchy because we already have a constitution in place that the central power isn't supposed to be as strong as it is right now. It's actually supposed to be more of a state's rights system. So I think we have a lot of the right things, but we got there, there's too many people here that keep getting voted back in and they're they're in that position because they can keep getting giving themselves stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, one on the hard currency thing, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but if you had to guess what percentage of our currency is actually hard currency right now, what would you guess? Like of all yeah, the circulating I, dollars in the world right now, how much do you think is actual dollars? And percent, maybe I would imagine it's all ones and zeros, man. Four percent. Four percent of all the U.S. currency that exists is real money, and the rest is just digital. And eight trillion of it has been printed in the last two years, right? So we're on that track for sure. Um, you know, and I, I think uh, to your other point about choosing to elect politicians and things like this. Um, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. It, it's it, like if you, th this is the point of my show, Citizen. You can either bitch and moan about your rights and wait for somebody to secure them for you and you'll be a subject under their rule, or you can secure them yourselves by performing the responsibilities required of you. And if you don't mm -hmm. perform, if you do not take care of yourself and be responsible, if you're not responsible for the people around you, you are your brother's keeper. That's a fact, right? You're responsible yes. for that homeless guy down the, on in your neighborhood. You're responsible for that guy. I don't give a fuck what you say, right? Especially if you're a Christian. Like, I don't want to hear about like, oh, the bums in my neighborhood. Like, no, you go help that dude, right? Um, that That's your job as a human being is to go help that guy. But if you don't, right, then there's going to be hundreds of those guys, thousands of those guys, and then the government's going to come in. And, you know, it, it's not all evil 
it, re- it requires money and some level of power and authority to address that issue, right? So you have to make this choice. You either suck it up and go deal with these problems yourself, or you wait around and the government is going to amass wealth and power, and it's going to come from you. The wealth is going to come from your pocketbook, and the power is going to come from your liberty, right? right. And they're going to use that to try to fix that problem. But then how do you insulate something that large? from bad actors, especially over vast amounts of time, 40, 50 years in politics and stuff like this. It's impossible, right? So we know that's impossible. So the only way that is reasonable to solve that issue is to solve the issues at the lowest possible level. When the government shows up in your neighborhood and nobody has their hand out, they have no power there. Yes. That, that's 100% true. And I, I think that is the thing. I, I'd really like to know the number of people that don't vote in their school board elections and don't vote in their mayoral elections and, you know, aren't involved in their, uh, you know, their HOA or whatever. Like there's people that just they don't care. And I think the problem is the local level is where you have the most ability to change things. National really doesn't matter a hill of beans, man. And I think but I'd, I'd love to know those numbers, because I think if we mm. can handle that, that is how you fix things. It's sure. actually on a micro level. Well, that's that's like how we set the government up in the fucking first place, man. Like we are, I wouldn't say that our founders were uh, are, were libertarian necessarily. Although uh, Thomas Jefferson was definitely libertarian. I'm not sure about the rest of them. Um, I think George Washington probably went back and forth. Um, Adams and and, uh, uh, and and some of the other guys they were more Adams federalist. was more of a federalist. Yeah, they and, and you know. Um, <laughs> Hamilton was Hamilton's one of the worst. Like of all the founding fathers, he was a, he was, he was he was a, a monarchist. Piece of shit. If anything. Yeah, he was a piece of shit. Yeah, he wanted to he wanted to institute a new monarchy for sure and a central bank all the way back in seventeen ninety or whatever seventeen ninety seven. Um, but anyways, I wouldn't say they were libertarian necessarily, but the ideology is very similar. It's like okay, we we recognize the danger of a monarchy, and they just played it out in their heads, right? One. Having that much centralized power is a problem for people. When the when the state is big, the individual is small, right? Yes. And they, they knew that and they articulated that in their documentation. Now, they made plenty of mistakes. There was a lot of tradition and hateful bullshit that played out in the American political sphere all the way until the 1960s, right? Two Almost 200 years of that bullshit. It took us to, to kind of get that right. But if you just read the information and take it for what it was, then you can see where their brain was at at the time. We need decentralization because what for two or for a couple of reasons. One, you're right. If if I vote in a presidential election, I have one one sixtieth million power over that, right? And you, irrespective of the electoral college or whatever, right? Let's just say it was a straight popular popular vote. I would have like one one sixty million of a vote. If I vote in my local county election in my county. It's like maybe one thirty thousand, and you can see like the the vast difference between voting power right there. And we yes. set it up like that on purpose. This this system of federalism was set up this way on purpose to make sure we didn't have strong federal government, right? Like strong like power over the states that that was never intended to be the case. Um, but you know, and people hate the government. They hate politicians for it, um, and you know that's reasonable. But you did it. Like just like with the kids, just like with this new generation of kids that everybody wants to talk shit about, we created that problem. And, ju- and, and through our laziness and our fear and our incompetence, we created this, this giant behemoth government, right? Everybody, like, everybody yes. talks about how fucking great of a conservative Republican Ronald Reagan was, despite the fact that he swelled the size of the government. He fucking banned machine guns. He uh, 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 tripled the national debt. Blah, we got blah, direct blah, to consumer stuff. advertising for for pharma under him, so there's a yeah. lot of things that that change negatively. Like I'm trying to think in my head of the last actual conservative president, and the the only one that is even close is Eisenhower, to be honest. And before him, I'm not sure who it would have been. Um, well, I think also a lot of what we're reaping now, Dan, and I don't. It's it's funny because people call you crazy when you talk about this, but I think a lot of it has to do with the actual progressive era. So we're talking like FDR, 1900 yeah. to like 21. So we're talking like mainly Woodrow Wilson, if you look at it. Like mm. 1913 was a really pivotal year. Um, December of 1913, we get the uh, the Federal Reserve Act that passes. We have the uh, income tax amendment passes. And then we also have- That was, have uh, what, the 13 or 14, right? That the income it tax was, It passes. was around there. Like it was yeah. definitely a bill in 13, but I don't think it came into effect until 14. Mm. Um, but, uh, and then you also have the 17th Amendment, which happens mm. in 13. So 17th Amendment made it so that states- 
legislatures no longer elected the Senate. And they were trying to solve a problem because people would take their friends and be like, hey, my friend can be a state, se- could be the senator. But the problem that happened is now you have two Congresses. So it's like, you know, the Senate doesn't really matter. So we, we broke it. And now we keep trying to build on the broken thing rather than fixing the, the problems that got us here. Yeah. And we haven't, um, like I, I hear Rogan talking about sometimes uh, that if the founding fathers were around today, um, they would, they would look at the constitution and be like, Hey, you guys haven't changed anything in this. And like, I don't, <laughs> exactly. I don't think that, I don't, I don't know that that's right though. Cause, um, the bill of rights was ratified in 1791, I think. Right. So pretty quickly after we, st- we started the country. Um, and since then we've, amended the constitution another 17 times. Right. So we have changed it quite a bit, but not meaningful, not meaningfully in a very long time. Um, like the last one was in what 92 and it was about congressional pay or some bullshit. Like we haven't addressed any actual issues. And you know, that's, I I don't necessarily think the constitution is a, is in its, at its core, a living document, but things do change, right? Circumstances change over time. Like you said, um, well, you look at it even like the technology we have now, Dan, like, like mm. our founding fathers couldn't even fathom the technology. We sure. Have yeah. Now. And then, you know, the composition and, uh, uh, I guess how, how the composition of the Senate changed over time is a problem now, right? Because it's, it, it, there's no functional purpose for it. It just may, may maybe, I, I don't know. I, I really like it, it was it was designed to serve a very specific purpose and it no longer does. So you're right about that. And we could fix that. But there's no version of this America where a constitutional amendment for anything gets passed. Right. There's no the 70 percent of people are not agreeing on anything ever again. That's not happening. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how to fix that necessarily. But again, like on, on the mass scale. But this is just another opportunity or uh, another example where the opportunity is in all of our hands. Um, federal power is like Tinkerbell. It only exists if we believe it exists, right? right. It only exists if you behave as if it does. Um, not to quote Game of Thrones, but I think Very said, power lies where men believe it lies. And that's an absolute yes. fact, right? Um, uh, and, and you could see that in the last three years or so. So for some reason, people believed that the government had the right to shut them in their homes and force vaccinate them and all this other stuff. Well, it reached a pivotal point with the forced vaccination and people pushed back. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then the next big issue that came up that had to do with censorship or authoritarianism from the federal government was this government governance disinformation board. I'm sure you remember this little oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. censorship group that they tried to pop prop up under department of Homeland security. Oh, you and you and I talked about this on, on citizen yeah, did, a yeah. bit. Like she works yeah. for, she works for the British government now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, for Boris Johnson who blew up the Ukraine deal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like we've, we've grown. You can tell like a lot of people are, um, a lot of people have become fatalistic and nihilistic about our plight here in the West, especially in the United States. But look at how things have – look at the trajectory of how things have gone recently. We've gone from accepting lockdowns, right, accepting the TSA shutting down flight and stuff like that to the next time they tried to force vaccinate people. And we're like, no, fuck you. But a lot of people did capitulate to that. And then the next yes. one was the governance disinformation board. And quite literally everyone was like, nope. Not one fucking prayer. And they shut that shit down within three weeks. And that woman got mm-hmm. fired, right? So you can see the power that the individual has. The individual's power is in locking arms with other people and saying no. That's the big, the most power that the individual will ever have is finding other people with whom to say no to authoritarianism, right? Well, and I, that's, I, that, that's how believer. you have to do that. I'm a big believer in the tide is actually turning, Dan. Like I think, mm-hmm. I think though living through those, those few years, I actually think the tide is turning. And I think you're seeing like the, to me, you always watch the money because I think the money shows us most what's happening. And if you mm-hmm. look at BlackRock and state street and Vanguard, and a lot of them are actually stopping mm-hmm. putting money into ESG like they were before. So that's mm-hmm. a huge indicator showing us that we're winning. You watch where yeah. the money's going. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, sports illustrated swimsuit edition is hot girls again. And Victoria's Secret is hot girls again, right? I mean, I know yeah. that's that seems maybe 
kind of banal to be honest. It, it, like who cares about that? But it's it, it it harkens back to 1984. In the end, the the party would say two plus two equals five, and you would have to believe it because the logic of their position demanded it. And the logic of their position is that the state makes the rules, right? And we've rejected that. This whole country is about rejecting that. But we did kind of slip down that well and let them start doing it for a while. And you can see how quickly that shit can turn from the 1990s to 2020, right? I mean, a massive difference in the way that human beings process information from the government. If somebody in 1990 would have tried to force vaccinate somebody or lock down the country because of a cold, we would have been like, fuck you, dude, get out of here. We're, we're all on cocaine. Get out of here. You know what I mean? Now in 2020, people are like, oh, I'm so scared of this thing. Like, fuck off, dude. You know, I mean, it's like, that's how quickly it can happen. 30 years, one generation shit can go completely tits up. And it, to Reagan's credit, one thing he did say was that uh, I think liberty is all, always one generation away from extinction or something like that. That's correct. Uh, very, very true statement. Absolutely. Well, Dan, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, man. I think we gave people a lot to think about and a lot to consider. And I, I think I'm I'm hopeful. I think we're actually in, in a position where, where a lot can change and a lot can be mm-hmm. good. But for, for people listening, man, if they want to connect with you, follow you, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, yeah, you can follow me at, uh, at Dan Holloway. It's H-O-L-L-A-W-A-Y. Um, pretty much on any platform, Instagram, Twitter, where I spend most of my time. Um, if you'd like this kind of conversation, then you can, you can find me at citizen podcast. Um, and if you like, if you're, if you're, you know, if you like gallows humor, if you're into the military humor stuff where we say a lot of crazy bullshit, uh, drinking bros is a good show to watch, but not around your kids. <laughs> Very cool. Dan Holloway. Thanks for coming on again, man. We'll have to have you on. Definitely have you on soon for people that are new to this channel. Please like this video, leave us a comment and smash that subscribe button. If you support Liberty freedom and want to build a better future and we will catch you guys next time.